for. And though it's not a, a completely clear-cut example, this is leakage, leakage from wet macular degeneration. This is it right here. Sometimes you'll see a space here, which would be nice for the purposes of this video, but but this is this is wet macular degeneration. And this is Dr. Malik last month. We gave him a shot, and here he is this month. So it's come down. Let me go back and show again. This is him right before the shot. And this is him after the shot, and the machine shows us down here the delta. And when the delta or change is in green, that means that it's thinner. So he's come down here, and you can see this little space here is better. So this is today. This is last time. Oh, yeah. Since last month, the vision has actually improved. And um, I, what I had was kind of like the, the words like melt, like a Salvador Dali uh, picture, and, and which is, I understand is fairly typical for is. wet macular degeneration. So you're reading a sentence, and, and right in the middle of the sentence, the words are melting and dropping down. And that's gone away. That's improved for sure. And what I do have, though, is like a big um, blue on this eye, when I outside, like over the house, there's a big yellow, big yellow moon, big yellow moon. And that uh, has actually improved a little bit in, this, in, this, in that, in the center of the yellow, it's getting, I can start to see blue sky behind it. So, Do you see a little spinning yellow thing at all that's lit at night, looks like a propeller? I'm not seeing that. When leakage comes or goes in the retina, a lot of patients will describe something that looks like a ceiling fan or propeller that spins. And, and we think that's the photoreceptors maybe moving a little bit as the leakage comes and goes. Okay. And they, and they see that. Now, I did have, I did have um, like a new floater after my last injection. And it was like I was seeing a fruit fly. Yes. <laughs> Is that common? It's very common. <laughs> so, so not only do we sometimes stir up the floaters in your eye, but we not infrequently introduce a bubble into the eye. And the bubbles are small. They're the size of a carbon bubble. So it's yeah. not like we, we can't completely get it out of the syringe like you do totally in the understand. ER. And, and so uh, I'd say probably one out of every two patients put a bubble in their eye. The bubble, the body absorbs it within yeah. a day or so. The bubble floats to the top part of your eye. However, you see it in the bottom part of your yeah. vision because everything in the eye is Because it was a very it. black... Perfect um, sphere? It was all, Well, I can't say it was a perfect sphere, but it was very... It was other than usual floaters, it was very black. Again, just like a, like a fruit fly moving around. Yes. Getting Dr. Mallet fixed up to give him an injection, and we'll talk about why we're doing that in a second. But what we do when we do this is we numb the eye and, and then we ultimately put some medicine in that has both numbing as well as cleaning medicine uh, on the surface of the eye. Years ago, 20 years ago, when these medicines first came out, this was much more of a production. We draped the patient, we would wear gloves, and, um, and, and it was kind of a big deal. Over the past two decades, we've changed the way we do it. We no longer drape the patient. We stopped wearing gloves because we can't control the needle as well when we wear gloves. That makes and, sense. And, uh, and for the record, I've washed my hands, but that was not on the video. But, uh, <laughs> but, we're, um, but we're not actually touching the eye with our hand. And we, and we no longer use a lid speculum, although some doctors still do. So we put in an anesthetic drop. Okay. And now we're the going tetra, to... Tetracaine is what you're using? Tetra, actually, this was... Yeah, this was tetracaine. You're absolutely okay. right. And then this is a combination drop. We use betadine and more tetracaine, but a more um, uh, uh, higher concentrated tetracaine. We used to use a gel, but the uh, FDA took that gel away from us. The gel was essentially viscous lidocaine. And um, and so this medicine that's in Dr. Malik's eye right now to numb it and clean the surface of it, it doesn't sterilize the surface of the eye. Betadine probably never completely sterilizes the skin, for instance, when you put it on the skin, but it works best when it dries, and we can't let it dry out in the eye. And so this medicine is numbing the eye as well as killing a lot of the bacteria. But the reality is, is that almost every time we give one of these shots, we are probably inoculating the eye with a few bacterium. And the eye's immune system is not good. It's, it's quite cloistered from the 
body's normal immune system, yet it is, we think, able to overcome these one or two bacterium that we're probably injecting each time we do this because we can't completely clean the surface of the eye. And the surface of the eye is, it has germs on it. It's just like any other mucosal membrane. And um, so the yet, risk, the risk though, is an infection of the eye called endophthalmitis. Endophthalmitis, that's exactly yeah, right. So an yeah. infection in the eye, we call that endophthalmitis. And, and how often does that happen? Roughly one in a thousand of the numbers you'll be yeah. quoted. Um, I, I think practically though, it's, it's significantly less that, but it happens. And so I took care of a patient this weekend who had gotten a shot last week and had an infection from the injection that we gave him. And it wasn't that we had done something wrong. It was a colleague of mine who had done the shot and he did exactly what he was supposed to yeah. do. But again, we're not completely um, eradicating the bacteria on the surface of the eye. We don't have a way to sterilize the surface of the eye without, uh, without damaging the surface of the eye. How do you know, uh, how do you know uh, that you might be getting an infection? You would have pain and, and diminished vision a couple days after the shot. Okay, so like two days from now, if I start to have increasing pain in the eye and my vision seems to be you know, going south, then I need to give you a call. Correct. So we usually tell patients two different things when we give them these shots. We tell them that if they have pain in two days, we want to know. We also tell them that we want them to use a lot of artificial tears because quite yeah. frankly, the thing that's, uh, that is uh, common to almost everyone that receives these shots is that um, they have some burning, and the burning's from these chemicals that we put in your eye. Yeah. All right, this is the shot. And I have a lot of tearing, though, too. Correct, um, and that's and from the, these caustic chemicals, the anesthetic lookup for me. This is the actual shot. So we go in about three and a half millimeters posterior to the limbus, maybe four millimeters. He feels some pressure when I do this, but no pain. And the reason that he isn't feeling the pain is because of the anesthetic. And also, it's because the needle is incredibly small. It's a 31 gauge needle. Look up for me, look around, there you go. So these are uh, antibiotic drops. The reality though is that were we to cause an infection, these antibiotic drops aren't gonna help Dr. Mallet. Yeah. Yet I use them as a, as a drop to flush the betadine out of the eye. I'm good and later that. on today, you'll use the, um, you'll use the, um, Look up again for me, sir. Later on today, you'll use tears. In fact, you'll use them right, right when you leave here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I felt a little pressure, just the itsy bitsy little little sting, but that was it. It didn't didn't bother me at all. And you saw kind of a, a thick, almost lava lamp, iridescent thing moving through your eye, right? Not this time. Not this time. Okay. <laughs> You're not a baby boomer, but the baby boomers are getting this in spades, and um, and they're living longer. And this is a disease of old age. Yeah. We don't understand completely what causes this damage to your retina. It, it, it's probably some environmental factors and genetics play a significant role too. My understanding is that smoking is, increases your chance for you know, age-related macular degeneration and genetics. And um, That's right. Does diet play a role? You know, hypothetically it does. We've, we've thought that things like being outdoors more and diet, you know, people that eat like I eat, like too much fried food and whatnot are at a great risk. But the reality is probably that the pivotal environmental factor that can uh, increase your odds of getting this is smoking. And, and we knew that going back 40 years or so, but about 20 years ago, some doctors in Miami, particularly a doctor named Scott Cousins, did a a lot of research that showed that this was significantly tied into smoking. Can you tell us a little bit about the AREDS? Uh, yeah, the, the AREDS is an acronym that stands for Age-Related Eye Disease Study. We're on the second generation of those vitamins, but even those are old. They've been out for 15 years. And it's, it's, it's a formulation of, of some antioxidants, including some fat-soluble antioxidants and zinc, that that can retard the progression from dry to wet, but but it's very limited. So, if you take those vitamins for seven years, 
you'll if you were somebody who could know beforehand that you were one of the people, the one out of five people with dry macular degeneration that was going to go to the wet form. So most dry macular degeneration does not convert to wet. A small percentage actually go on to become yeah about twenty percent give or yeah. take. And and you know the longer you live, it's a greater risk. But you're in good company, so you you're, you don't have a, a uncommon problem. But the the ARADs they will retard if you take them for seven years, it'll retard your progression by a third. I was going to ask, is there is there a cheap uh, knockoff that works as far? Yeah, as I'll tell patients a lot of times to get the Walmart, for instance, has a generic equivalent. It's not the exact same as ARADs, but I, you know I think it's close enough. The Walmart, uh, so to speak, equivalent of the ARADs. Um, those are not meant to be taken in lieu of a multivitamin. So you still take a multivitamin. In fact, in the ARAD study, Centrum Silver was the multivitamin that was used in addition to the ARADs vitamins. So what's the chances of me going blind with this? Uh, I mean, very since, low. Since, you know, basically, I still have my peripheral vision probably the rest of my life, but what about that central? Right, were we to not be giving you these shots, you could go legally blind. In other words, you'd legally be so blind. blurry centric, but you'll never go darkness blind from the disease process itself. So even if we weren't giving you these shots, you would still never go blind in the way that, that, that the lay person thinks of blindness. Yeah, yeah. But the ophthalmic community realized early on that a lot of what we take care of, both in this disease you have, wet macular degeneration, but in other diseases too, that involve the retina, a lot of the things that we take care of involve leakage in the retina. And so we were quick to realize the potential benefit of these, and then some enterprising clinicians and basic science doctors evolved those drugs and further developed them for use inside the eye. This is our mainstay treatment now, not just for wet macular degeneration, but a variety of other retinal issues that cause either leakage or new vessels to grow. Okay. So the drugs counteract the body's normal hormone, vascular endothelial growth factor, because that hormone in the eye becomes errant. These new blood vessels growing under the retina are bad in the example I gave you, but they're also bad in things like diabetes. They, yeah. Diabetes, they yeah. don't grow under the retina, they grow yeah. on top of the yeah. retina. So let's say we get an infection in the eye. Um, is that oral me medicines or no. you get, I you, you get admitted to the hospital so, or get IV? No, no? Um, outpatient. years ago we used to do some things like that. Now we primarily treat it as an outpatient thing. And so, you know, I mentioned to you, I saw a patient this weekend on an emergent basis. They saw the general ophthalmologist, they received a shot for, for wet macular degeneration and developed an infection from the shot. And the, remember I mentioned that the eye's immune system is not very right. good. Right. Part of that is the inside of the eye is very cloistered from the rest yeah. of the body. And so giving somebody either systemic or topical antibiotics, in other words, eye drops that you put in the eye, um, is insufficient. They won't get right. into the eye in sufficient quantity. So if you were to suffer an infection from the injection I just gave you, what we would need to do is give you another injection into your eye, what we call okay. an intravitreal injection of an antibiotic. And so for instance, this weekend, the guy that had the infection, we gave him an injection in his eye of antibiotic okay. because that's the only way to get the antibiotic into this cloistered system right. in sufficient quantity to treat it. Very good. I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, uh, do some teaching here. There's nothing like seeing what's going on and hearing an expert talk about uh, the particular treatment and the disease, and, and so this is going to be very helpful. You are quite welcome. It's a scary problem. It affects a lot of people. The yeah. shot itself is other than a little bit of pressure. Do you yeah. agree it's not bad? Yeah, no, And no. then the burning.